developments in managing ischemic heart disease since 1950s. So uh, this will be conducted under five categories. And now I would like to introduce the presenters of today's symposium. Uh, Mr. Lalisha Sumanapala, Ms. Chamudi Appa, Ms. Sindhu Chaudhya Rajan, Ms. Garsha Kodikara, and Mr. Shamin Turhena. So without further delay, we will move to our first speaker, Lalisha Sumanapala, who is going to present the Framingham study, closed chest CPR, and the start of CCUs. Over to you, Lalisha. Well, uh, thank you, Tavisha. And uh, sorry about the video quality and the lighting. And uh, we'll, I think, We'll, we can straight away go into our presentation. All right. So uh, our topic today is uh, the development of ma some major developments of uh, management of ischemic heart disease from 1950s. So uh, when we consider the development of uh, and the progress of uh, the development of uh, the management modalities, uh, many of these modalities started arising around 1960s, the early 1960s. So uh, it is around 1960s uh, that these uh, which was uh, there was there, there was a death surge, sudden death surge starting from 1950s and before that as well. Uh, and it is around 1960s that this death toll suddenly started to decrease. So therefore, my topic today is 1960s, 60s, the beginning of the end of the coronary heart, coronary heart disease death surge. So today, uh, I'll give a brief discussion about what I am going to discuss with you all. So at first, uh, I'll be talking about the situation of the disease before 1960s, including the 1950s as well. And the next segment is uh, the situation of the disease and the management modalities that were prevalent before 1960s. And the last segment is the 1960s, the beginning of the end of the death toll. And I have a small disclaimer to make to you guys that uh, there are a few facts that we have. These are a few facts that we have arranged with the help of online research. And we have tried our best to maintain high accuracy to the best of our current knowledge as medical students. And before going on to the rest of the presentation, let me welcome all of the uh, all of you who have come here, who have joined uh, this session with us, including our academic staff. And, uh, Let's go into the presentation. Yes, uh, so the situation of the disease before 1960s, people were living uh, longer uh, than earlier because, uh, the, because the decrease of deaths from infectious diseases has been reduced. And also, uh, the diet uh, with the development uh, with the increased production of processed food and uh, they had uh, gotten used to using more saturated fats and added sugars in their diet and also uh, with the development uh, with the development of automobiles and and with the introduction of more busy lifestyles lifestyles they had uh, become more or less become less physically active as well another uh, condition is another uh, cause is that uh, there was a spectacular increase in cigarette smoking during that time and we can see in these photos that even doctors were used to market these uh, smoking uh, in a way that it will provoke the people to it will manipulate the people to uh, use these kind of things so what happened was that because of this Ischemic heart diseases were becoming one of the major causes of death in UK, USA, and many other countries around the world. I think you can see uh, in the background, the, the, site, the research paper uh, that I have put in the background is about that, and there are many other articles about that as well. Yes, uh, moving on to the second segment, the situation of the disease and disease and some management modalities that were present before 1960s. So uh, 
So if we start from the beginning, the circulatory system was uh, explained by Dr. William Harvey in 1628. What I have uh, put in the background is the research paper that he had, uh, is a book that he had uh, put forward. I hope that we will be able to share these resources as well with you all. Uh, well, uh, then uh, it was Dr. William Herbden who uh, brought angina pectoris to the attention uh, of the medical prof uh, professionals uh, by presenting a paper as uh, some account of, of a disorder of the breast at the Royal College of Physicians in London in 1768. And he had described this as a painful, most disagreeable sensation in the breast, which seems as if it could take their life away if it were to increase or continue. But the moment they stand still, this all vanishes. So uh, after that, there have been many uh, small small advances uh, and putting forward some theories regarding this uh, coronary artery diseases. And uh, anyhow, uh, the treatment modalities was, were a bit haphazard uh, back in those days. So uh, the the British uh, Heart Foundation, this publication by the British Heart Foundation uh, called, called uh, 50 Years at Heart of Health uh, had told at those days that in the 1960s that there, were no, there was no treatment for heart attack. And if they survived, the victims were confined to hospital bed, given painkillers and told to take a complete rest. Well, as, you, as we all know now, the, these modalities have changed completely and exercising is advised. So moving on to the interesting segments, the 1960s, the beginning of the end of Death Star. There are three major events that occurred during this time. And uh, they, we can say three major findings and uh, discoveries as well. One of them is, the, is a study done by the American Heart Association, uh, the Framingham Heart Study. And the other one is the closed chest CPR introduction and the introduction of coronary care units. Moving on to the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, actually, it is uh, related to the politics of the US as well. So uh, it was the death of uh, President Franklin Roosevelt well, due to a massive heart attack, which caused the, his successor, Harry Truman, to sign this US National Heart Act, which led to the uh, formation of the U.S. National Heart Institute, uh, which you can see, you can see the background of their first uh, heart institute in the uh, a photo of the background photo in the background of their first heart institute, and they are the ones who did this Framingham study. Actually, but the, how this name came into play was uh, it was a small city close to New York uh, in Massachusetts in U uh, in USA. So the study was initially done based on this village, but later it was spread into different ethnic, ethnic groups and different uh, regions of USA as well. So uh, the first report of this long-term study, you can see the uh, study, uh, the, the report in the background. Uh, this, this was published in 1961. Uh, the factors of risk in the development of coronary heart disease a six-year follow-up experience. Actually, this was a cohort study done, and it is a very well-known cohort study as well. And the study showed that high, high blood pressure, smoking, and high cholesterol levels were major factors in heart disease. And uh, actually, this study did not stop after that. It continued, and it's even now it is being continued. They had, uh, they had found some new findings in 2009, 2010 as well. So the study still continues. So it went on to discover many more information about heart diseases and it's still going on being a valuable research in the study of heart disease. So moving on to another uh, interesting segment. Do you know how chest massaging was done early days? With that, uh, let me share you a video clip Uh, I hope, I hope, uh, 
U.S. when we think all U.S. well. So, uh, was that the way that uh, just massaging was done earlier days? No, uh, it was another interesting way of uh, it was another interesting way of uh, doing it. And now, I am what I am going to do, show you is how it was done earlier. Now, prepare to open the chest. Feel for the fifth intercostal space and incise with any sharp instrument that is at hand. Absence of bleeding confirms your diagnosis. Make a second and deeper cut to divide the muscles and pleura. Spread the ribs firmly apart to make the heart more accessible. Then hold the heart between the flat of your hands and start cardiac massage at once. Wait for the ventricles to fill between each manual compression. The rate of massage will depend on the rate of filling. Yes, actually that was how uh, the chest massaging was done in earlier days. So they had to open the chest cavity and uh, then do chest massaging. So uh, this introduction of uh, closed chest CPR is really a breakthrough in the management of uh, ischemic heart diseases as well. So. Uh, the closed chest massage was introduced by Dr. Hoven Hoven. Uh, he's known as the father of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, the crucial aspect of this technique, I think you can read uh, about this uh, as well uh, later. Uh, so, anyhow, uh, what happened was on this basis, many national and international guidelines uh, were arising how to perform PCR, sorry, CPR as well. So uh, that was a major breakthrough in the treatment modalities. So uh, as, you have, uh, as you can see, this is an early defibrillator, so not like what you have seen in the earlier video. Uh, it actually, when they came on, it, uh, they were even more bigger than this. Now they have been uh, reduced to the size of a small briefcase as well. So this is a picture of an early defibrillator. And <laughs> The uh, third important thing is uh, introduction of coronary care units. So, uh, why? Uh, and uh, also, uh, introduction of coronary care units together with this technique of uh, closed chest pulmonary uh, resuscitation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, they the groundwork for coronary care units, uh, specialized intensive care units of our patients with acute myocardial infarctions. So what was the objective? The objective was clustering these patients in a single hospital unit where necessary equipments and drugs were, were readily available and also uh, trained personnel were readily available. With uh, these discoveries not only supported the ongoing treatment process, but it uh, actually provoked a, a huge wave of awareness around the world. So, as you can see, this is an advertisement done by the British Heart Foundation. Uh, 
uh, warning about how a heart attack might feel for them, the sort of compression that they will be feeling in their heart. So also uh, uh, smoking cessation happened following to this uh, this awareness program. A lot of people quit smoking. Yes, uh, with this implementation, it was just a matter of time for many countries to observe a steep decline in heart deaths in deaths due to coronary heart diseases. You can see the causes. If you see the graph, uh, you can see the uh, CCUs, uh, surgery, surgical advances, and uh, exercise and social socioeconomic uh, changes. With these things, it led to a massive decline of this uh, surge. So uh, that is what happened during the, the early 60s up to the, seventh, uh, up to the uh, 1970s as well. So uh, it concludes my uh, segment and uh, I'm handing over to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Lalisha, for your interesting presentation. And uh, now I would like to call upon our next speaker, Chamudi Apa, who is going to uh, talk on uh, the hypertension detection and follow-up and the percutaneous uh, transvascular coronary angioplasty. Thank you. Chamudi. Good evening, all of you. Uh, today I am going to talk about hypertension detection and follow up program in early 1970s uh, coronary artery bypass graft and first percutaneous coronary angioplasty, which has been happened in 1977. Uh, first, we shall see something about uh, hypertension detection and follow up program in early 90s. Uh, first, we shall see some pathophysiology. Mm, hypertension leads to endothelial injury. Hypertension leads to endothelial injury by increasing the shear forces. Uh, it leads to uh, increase the risk of having atherosclerotic plates. So vascular lumen may be narrowed and it can be occluded. So coronary heart disease can be recited uh, by worsening of hypertension. Then uh, on the other way, hypertension increase the afterload. Uh, then uh, left ventricle wants to, the left ventricle has to do more work. Increase so it leads to increased myocardial demand and decreased diastolic coronary blood flow. Uh, this leads to myocardial ischemia. Um, in hypertension detection and follow up program, beta blocker uh, find, inven, invention of beta blockers is a um, uh, revolutionized medical management of hypertension. In 1964, James Black synthesized the first clinically significant beta blockers. Example, the first uh, clinically significant beta blocker is uh, the invented one, propanolol. Uh, as beta blockers, we can see uh, labitalol, isopalol, like that. Uh, the functions of the beta blockers are it decreases the oxygen demand of myocardium, decreases heart rate, and decreases myocardial contractility. By these kind of things, it leads uh, to decrease the heart, uh, may, uh, hypertension as a major risk factor for coronary heart uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, 
coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, it was first done in May 2nd, 1960 by a team led by Dr. Robert H. Watts and the thoracic surgeon. Surgical procedure to restore normal blood flow and obstruct um, obstructed coronary artery. The procedure is uh, we can take a vein from leg and it can be grafted to coronary artery to bypass a blockage. Then it will be a new passage to go to go, uh, new passage for blood flow. First percutaneous coronary angioplasty. It has been happening in 1977. Um, this is minimally invasive procedure due to open uh, minimally invasive procedure to block stenosed coronary artery allowing unobstructed blood flow to myocardium. Uh, name itself came because of uh, it's uh, done through skin um, and lumen of the artery. It was first developed in 1977 by Andreas Gutensig. The first procedure took place uh, September 16 in 1977. Initially, it was performed using balloon catheter alone due to subclinical outcomes and vessel stenosis. Some devices introduced example atherosclerosis devices. Then after that, with some improvement, we still have coronary stents, BMS, bone metal stents, DES, and drug eluting stents. The newer generation DES has reduced the incidence of late stent thrombosis. The goal of this program is. Uh, the goals of this program can be divided into two categories, the primary goal and the secondary goal. Primary goal is to reduce total mortality and secondary goal is to check whether a substantial proportion of hypertensive could be detected, whether this kind of program is more beneficial than more beneficial or this will be toxic to check whether this is beneficial in young as well as in old, to check whether this is beneficial in males or females. Uh, these are the things uh, uh, we have to talk about. Hypertension detection and follow-up. Hypertension detection and follow-up program in 1970 and coronary artery bypass graft and first percutaneous coronary angioplasty. And that's all. Over to you, Tavishya. Uh, yes, thank you very much Tavishya, for the presentation. And next, we'll move to our speakers in the Jaude Rajat, who is going to present on development of drugs for high blood pressure and high blood cholesterol. Sindhuja. Ayas Chamudi, uh, yeah, okay. During the 1987 to the 1988, these are the period where the powerful drugs are invented. First, we'll have a look at the discovery of statin. In the 1950 to 1960, it became obvious that elevated concentrations of a plasma cholesterol represented a major risk factor for the development of heart disease, which led to the quest for the drugs that could reduce it. In 1976, the Japanese biochemist 
Akira Endo isolated a factor from the fungus and identified as a competitive inhibitor of HMG coir reductase and named it as a mevastatin. However, the clinical trials in 1978 had made stopped because of the animal tumors. Meanwhile, the Merck isolated a related compound known, named lovastatin from the fermentation of Aspergillus terus. Sankyo gets credit as co-discovering the same compound. By 1980, clinical trials of lovastatin began and they were completed in 1986 and the FDA approved to become the first commercial statin in 1987. Pravastatin was developed in 1991 and Merck developed Simvastatin in 1991 and four other synthetic drugs called Fluvastatin, Rosovastatin, Pitavastatin and Atovastatin are subsequently developed. Now we'll move on to the discovery and development of angiotensin converting inhibitors. In 1968, John Wayne showed that peptides from the Brazilian viper's venom inhibited the activity of ACE from dog lung. In mid 70s, captopril was developed as the first orally active antihypertensive inhibitor and introduced to the market in 1981. By mid 80s, Captopril had a rival in enalapril, which initially appeared to have a better side effect profile as well as an easier dosing. In 1987, the consensus study is was the first trial to demonstrate the mortality reduction using an ACE inhibitor in heart failure. In 1992, the SAVE study shows that ACE inhibitors reduce long-term mo mortality in post-MI with left ventricular dysfunction. Then we'll move on to the discovery of calcium channel blockers. The discovery of the drug arose from the pharmacological study of screened coronary dilators in a program of a pharmacological taxonomy in 1964, and Jageno and Scapa had examined the diphenyl methylpiprazines on coronary arteries in dog in 1967. Among this, the lidoflazine had been selected from that series for clinical studies and patients suffering angina pectoris. Gottfried observed the calcium effect contraction was dose dependently reduced by lidoflazine and cinerizine and concluded that these were acting as calcium antagonists. However, at the high concentrations of cinerizine, the antagonism was insurmountable and such observations has ex extended to other non-competitive antagonists. Albert Fleckenstein made his study on the inhibitory effect of verapamil on electromechanical coupling in mammalian myocardium. The FDA has approved the first combination of an angiotensin receptor blocker, Valsartan, with a calcium channel blocker, amlodipine, for the initial treatment of hypertension. Then we'll move on. The other milestone achieved during this period was the effort for thrombolysis in MI. The history of thrombolytic therapy began in 1933, and it was discovered from the broad cultures of beta hemolytic streptococci, and they have found that it can dissolve a fibrin clot. Then they have discovered the streptokinase in clinical application in combating fibrinous pleural exudates and tuberculous meningitis. And it was first used in acute MI in 1958. In TIMI 1 studies, conducted in the 1983 to 1985, they have assessed the relative thrombolytic activity and side effects of recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, activator versus intravenous streptokinase in acute MI patients. In TIMI-2 trials that was conducted during 1986 to 1988, it assessed the intravenous recombinant tissue plasminogen activator given in the early hours of acute MI, showed be followed by the PTCA. These were the results of the TM, TIMI-1 trial. 
and you can able to see the recanalization and the patency of the arteries are comparably greater in the tissue plasminogen activity rather than the streptokinase. Then comes the invention of the first coronary stent for angioplasty on 1988. This is a minimally invasive endovascular procedure used to widen narrowed or obstructed arteries or veins typically to treat arterial atherosclerosis. Wall stent is the first coronary stent implanted in human coronary artery by Sigwart in 1986. Palmas Schwartz stent in 1987 is the first FDA approved stent which was widely used during 1990s. However, there were, there were complications with the bare metal stent, the endothelial disruption, the vascular inflammation, and the vascular smooth muscle injury can eventually lead to the, to the stent thrombosis and instant cause re -stenosis. So it leads to the invention of drug diluting stents and that's all about the milestones achieved during this period. Thank you. Thank you, Sinduja. So then I would like to invite Darsha Kodikare to present on the topic, Scandinavian Simvastatin Survival Study and Systolic Hypertension in Elderly and Streamia Trial. Darsha, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Harisha. I'm going to present about the Scandinavian Simvastatin survival study, which was done in 1994. As we all know, Simvastatin uh, is a HMG coa reductase inhibitor. Scandinavian Simvastatin Survival Study, OLS, POES. This is the trial was decided to evaluate the effect of cholesterol lowering with simvastatin on mortality and morbidity in patients with coronary artery disease. Patients with angina pectoralis saw previous myocardial infarction and serum cholesterol level 5.5 to 8 millimol per liter on a liquid lowering diet were randomized to double blind treatment with simvastatin or placebo. 4,444 patients were taken and 2,221 were treated with the Simva study and 2,223 were taken as placebo. Now you can see 30% of this reduction. This study shows that long-term treatment with Simva study is safe when it improves the survival in coronary artery disease patients. Then I would like to talk about systolic hypertension in elderly or SHED study. This is how blood pressure changes according to their, according to the age of the patients. Uh, this is the, uh, this was done according to the classification of hypertension according to WHO. Isolated systolic hypertension was taken uh, more than uh, systolic blood pressure, more than 140 millimeter mercury, and the diastolic blood pressure was taken uh, as uh, less than 90. There was a subgroup, it was borderline, it was between 100, 140 to 149. Diastolic blood pressure was taken less than 90. This is the classification according to the American uh, Heart Association. This is the latest classification we are using. It was uh, taken normal blood pressure as less than 120, uh, the systolic blood pressure, and the diastolic blood pressure is taken less than 80. 
elevated blood pressure is taken as between 120 to 129 and the diastolic blood pressure is taken less than 80. There are two stages of hypertension as stage one and two. You can uh, get the ranges as given in the diagram. This, uh, this was done in 1996. It established the benefit of treating isolated systolic hypertension in elderly. Many other blood pressure trials were followed. The systolic hypertension in elderly program was a randomized double blind, as I told before, and uh, it uh, shows the reduced uh, uh, reduce incidence of fatal and non-fatal stroke. This is the outcome of this study. You can see there is a 30% of reduction of risk reduction taught from the total mortality, and there is 36% uh, of the risk reduction from the stroke. Other than the hypertension, we can uh, advise the patients the quitting smoking, a healthy diet, and exercise may reduce the risk of heart disease. Yes, Shami. Yes, thank you very much, Garsha. So our last speaker is Shamin Turuhena, the present of the topic, Systolic Blood Pressure Intervention Trial, Spring. Uh, Shamin, the screen is open for you. Uh, good evening, thank you very much. Today, my topic is systolic blood pressure intervention trial sprint. Uh, what is the sprint? Uh, sprint is a randomized controlled clinical trial examining the effect of a high blood pressure treatment strategy aimed at reducing systolic blood pressure to lower goal than is currently recommended. Uh, so, what is the importance of sprint? Uh, we know that high blood pressure is still the number one cause of death in the world and it is a leading risk factor for stroke, heart disease, chronic kidney disease and other conditions. Uh, previous trials demonstrated the effectiveness of treating systolic blood pressure to about 140 mm Hg. Uh, SPRINT will produce critical evidence regarding feasibility, benefits and potential risk of more intensive blood pressure control. In this slide, uh, you can see the standard treatment of the sprint. Uh, this slide shows the intensive treatment of the sprint. Uh, in the sprint, there are some criteria, uh, which are major inclusion criteria and major exclusion criteria. Uh, in the screen, there are some criteria which are major inclusion criteria and major exclusion criteria. Uh, now we can see the major inclusion criteria. Uh, age should be above 50 years old, and systolic blood pressure should be within 130 to 180 mm Hg, and it can be treated or untreated. Uh, there are some additional cardiovascular disease risks, uh, clinical or subclinical cardiovascular disease, but it excludes the stroke. Uh, then chronic kidney disease, uh, objective glomerular filtration rate uh, within 20 to 6 milliliter per minute per 1.73 square meter and age should be above the 75 years. Next slide. Uh, 
we can see the major exclusion criteria. They are mellitus, effective blood filtration rate is then 20 milliliter per minute per 1.7 square meter. Then over to you, Garsha. Thank you very much, Shami. Now I'm going to talk about the ischemia trial. Schemia trial is the latest trial. It was done in 2019. It was associated with reduction in major adverse ischemic events compared with optimal medical therapy among the patients with stable ischemic heart disease and moderate to severe myocardial ischemia on non-invasive stress testing. 5,179 patients were selected for that uh, they used some inclusion criteria. Then they divided the patients into two groups according to the therapy they use as invasive therapy and radical therapy. For the invasive therapy, they used 2,588 patients and for the radical therapy, they used 2,591 patients. The outcome can be classified as primary and secondary. Primary outcomes were the deaths from the cardiovascular causes, myocardial infarction, resuscitated cardiac arrest, hospitalization, unstable angina or heart failure. The secondary outcome can be death due to cardiovascular causes or myocardial infarction. Although the overall interpretation was negative, there were mixed findings with evidence for both harm and benefit. Invasive therapy for stable ischemic heart disease patients needs to be carefully considered in the context of angina burden and background medical therapy. Likelihood that optimal coronary revascularization can be achieved with low procedural complications. Over to you, Shamin. Uh, now, see the evolution of managing ischemic heart disease in the 1950s. In 1960, uh, Framingham Heart Study identified smoking, high blood pressure, and high blood cholesterol as major cardiovascular risk factors. In 1960, First coronary bypass surgery was done as surgical procedure to bypass clotted arteries. In 1964, publicized the danger of cigarette smoking. In early 1970s, demonstrated the benefit of treating even moderate hypertension. Again in 1970s, discovered low-density lipoprotein receptor by laying groundwork for statics. In 1977, First percutaneous transvascular coronary angioplasty was done, commencing successful restoration of perfusion in occluded coronary arteries via percutaneous catheter. In 1984, established the benefit of cholesterol lowering. In 1987, established standards and targets for blood pressure and cholesterol. In 1987 to 88, Development of statin, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and calcium channel blockers were done. In 1987, thrombolysis in acute myocardial infarction introduced. In 1988, first coronary stent was done, making angioplasty more durable. In 1994, first statin endpoint trial showed reduction in mortality. In 1996, established the benefit of treating isolated systolic hypertension in elderly. In 2015, established the benefit of intensive blood pressure control to target systolic blood pressure less than 120 mm Hg in high-risk patients without diabetes. In 2019, ischemia trial was done as an international study of comparative health effectiveness with medical and invasive approaches. Uh, finally, 
we suppose it is to be continued in future with more new trials and discoveries to the betterment of human beings Uh, thank you for listening. Right, so it's obvious that this is not something that has popped out of nowhere, but it's like a process that has evolved eventually. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And now we have come to the end of this session. And uh, now the screen is uh, open for the Q&A session. So either you can unmute your mic or put them in the chat box. Um, yeah. Also, uh, I'd like to add something that uh, since our academic staff is already there, if, uh, if not questions, uh, if there are anything that we should have added, then uh, any comments about the uh, presentations and uh, any uh, things that you have to give uh, any advice, uh, also we are we are welcoming that as well. Hello, I'm Dr. Mayurathan. <clears throat> well done, team. Uh, it's very professional. I'm very happy to listen to this um, presentation. Uh, I know the 12 best students are much more capable of doing many presentations like this. Uh, I would like to say only a few uh, 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 words uh, or about all of you. Uh, and starting with our moderator, Tavishya, well done. It's very clear when you talk, uh, <clears throat> I think everybody can understand. Uh, it was very, very uh, good. Uh, but maybe uh, at the beginning, you may have said about uh, these are our uh, topics and these are the people going to talk about it. Uh, I don't know, uh, I, I joined about five minutes later but if you have started like that and uh, for a people like uh, outsiders, uh, it might be very useful. And coming to Lalisha uh, and all of you. So if you uh, on the video, when you talk, uh, whoever the speakers, uh, if you show your uh, video, the picture, uh, it might it will be very useful because this is a symposium. And Lalisha, well done. Only thing, uh, background, uh, the very important slides all are in the background image. Maybe I don't know. So better if you put those uh, as a uh, images in between your uh, sentences. And if you show this, this is how the initial one, the even trials and pictures, because it is a background picture you were telling, you can see that in the background image, uh, it was not very clear. That's otherwise it's very good. And Chamudi, um, it, it's, it's uh, good, very good slides. And um, uh, the images are good in between. And, um, uh, very, uh, she was reading the sentences very clearly and uh, we could be able to go with her. And uh, coming to Sintuja, Sintuja's images also, the screen is very good. And uh, one important point I would like to say about Sintuja, she was just paraphrasing the sentences, most of the sentences, that was very good for a presenter, just rather than reading the sentences, just paraphrasing and telling those sentences is uh, uh, very good. But some of the slides are overcrowded, too many information in some slides. Uh, and I think uh, your slide with the stent, uh, I was wondering why only half of the slides, the letters are there, other half is empty, uh, but um, you can show the 
stent image also from the beginning that was it will be very good garsha uh, is good i could be able to see her face uh, at the beginning and uh, uh, most of her slides only the pictures and uh, images she was uh, talking spontaneously that was very good and uh, maybe the last presenter chamin Uh, maybe Garsha may be moving the slides. He may be talking from the different place. There may be that may be the reason because little bit of pause uh, in between your presentation. Uh, and otherwise, these uh, are excellent. Okay, for your uh, medical student level. And uh, I was just thinking about how we were. Uh, do but we were doing when we were medical students. Now, uh, the, your presentation skills and your uh, slides and uh, the way of presentation, <clears throat> everything is excellent, and uh, we are very proud of you. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, thank you very much for the compliment, sir. Uh, yes, uh, regarding my presentation and the uh, problems that you told, sir. Uh, I also uh, found some interesting and very rare uh, research articles and books. Uh, so, yes. if uh, I will uh, find some way to uh, to be able to share those things as well, I think it will yes, be yes. because those were very very interesting. Now, Lalisha, even many of us may not have seen those images. So if you show those images in some um, 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 slides. Rather than putting it as a background image, um, it, it will enhance your uh, uh, presentation. I, I'll definitely work something out, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you very much, sir, for your comment. And we would like to improve ourselves in the uh, coming future, coming uh, presentations, sir. Yes, please switch on your video. Okay, so we, we everybody is interested to see the present present, especially when you do the presentation because it's a symposium, no? So yes. we like to uh, see you all. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam and Sir, for your comments. On uh, so uh, since the absence of the questions, uh, we would Rajin, like to Rajiv and maybe they are to say yeah, hello. Things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, no questions as usual, uh, <laughs> as expected from our students. No questions. Right. Okay. So congratulations to the team and congratulations to the full batch. So you have done it, done an excellent job. I, I know I didn't make things easy in any way for you. I. Dragged you all to the deep water and pushed you all in. I just told them the topic: do this, uh, uh, find out what were the innovations that happened from the 1950s, and do a symposium. I didn't give them any other instructions. <laughs> so they did a excellent job. They did a lot of research. They learned a lot of things. So only yesterday I went through their slides a little just. To polish things up a little bit, and uh, yeah, so I'm sure that you all also will agree that going through this process, you all uh, uh, gained a lot of new knowledge which you wouldn't have got through any lectures or any other way. So we hope to that we can do similar sessions. For other modules as well, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so excellent work, good job. Yes, thank you very much, sir. And I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to you, sir, uh, for giving us the guidance in this uh, simple to uh, have this symposium. Uh, so, and I would like to thank my dear colleagues who shared the information with us today, and thank you all for joining this symposium. And we'll end this session and good night.